tone chaser. That thing you hear in your head that you just can't quite get. Hello, everybody. How are you? Hope you're all good. So we're coming up to the last section, last segment, last piece. Episode six with Alex Van Halen from 1985. I hope you guys have dug the previous five uh, installments. I hope I didn't oversell it. I think it's uh, pretty pretty historic. Um, um, I, I, I don't think Alex ever went this uh, into depth um, about these kinds of subjects, you know what I mean? So anyway, man, I, I, I really hope uh, you enjoyed it. And for those of you who are yelling and screaming about segment four, apologies. The professional in me didn't put in new batteries when I was talking to Alex. And so what you're hearing are the batteries running down, the batteries dying, me dying uh, when I heard it back. But um, my very capable assistant, not my assistant, my very capable audio director, Adam Roach, um, fixed it as much as he could. So uh, I think there's some stuff there. You can still hear what's going on. Anyway, guys, take a listen and um, be looking for some more Van Halen related stuff. I have uh, an amazing archive of really very rare interviews with some uh, key people in, in Edward's life. So be on the lookout, okay? See you guys. Decided to get their fucking shit together. All of a sudden, that record just skyrocketed. I have a feeling, well, I think it was probably a combination of both. That thing was just building. And the, yeah, the I know. It's hard, was, it's, hard to draw a black, it's, and, it's hard to draw a line and see yeah. what the black and white is yeah. as to what caused it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the facts are there. The, the record did do very well. Yeah. And uh, I think every, every uh, piece of help or input uh, on, the, on the behalf of the company will do it good. And I right now I have a, a sense that uh, Warner Brothers is really going to push this, rec yeah, this next record. I, I believe it, yeah. Look, any time that Mo Austin gives me a personal call and remembers what my name is, <laughs> uh, you know, he calls me up and uh, um, I said, hello, Mr. Austin. And he said, don't call me Mr. Austin, call me Mo. <laughs> I said, okay, Mo. <laughs> you know? hmm. yeah. It shows you what can be done. Yeah, yeah. So when 5150 was built, I mean, Edward must have been happy. He must have been... Ecstatic, yeah. You know. No, this is, this is his toy. What, what basically started out as being a room where he could put his amps and his keyboards and the guitars and the rest of the stuff which was about a room the size of uh, this area that we're sitting right here <laughs> finally turned out to be a full-fledged whole hog studio mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean conceivably uh, uh sorry 1984 couldn't have been recorded at sunset sound just the whole feeling and the just everything i think it would have been a lot different mm -hmm. i think it would have been a lot uh a lot more sterile mm -hmm. 1984 was the one thing that we did where we had the freedom and not the pressure and not the guy sitting behind a double glass plate mm -hmm. with the red light that says recording. Mm -hmm. Most of the songs, most of the, be the, the best songs were recorded, like Jump was recorded about 3 o'clock in the morning. Really? An actual Ed just Yeah, Ed just gave me a call and he said, hey, listen, I've got something really good here. And yeah, he played it for me before, but it sounded different than the time he played it before. <laughs> but we played it, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was Don, Ed, and I, and we played it. Mike, Mike it didn't great. play on that? Mike came on later. Really? I think, if I remember correctly, um, but that's neither here nor there. The yeah. point is that it was just the freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, when Ed calls, you know, day, night, why do you think I live so mm -hmm. close to him? Mm -hmm. Four minutes away. Mm -hmm. Ed, no, give me a buzz, no problem. Hmm. I'll be there. What was Dave like working at 5150? Did he like the idea? He was a shithead. <laughs> he was a fucking pure shithead. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, because of his upbringing or his background or his compulsive feeling of trying to be better than everybody or outdoing somebody. 
He was never relaxed in the studio. Really? Not in the studio, not on stage, nowhere. He was always the one, the calculating, okay, well, it's 12 o'clock. Hey, you're one minute late. Where you been? Let's go. Come on, right now. Okay, let's go. All right, so we're ready to go, and you go, <clears throat> oh, hey, my voice, my throat, I can't sing right now. I got to go. You know what I mean? He was a very uh, two-sided person. When it suited him to, uh, to perform, so to speak, and everybody else wasn't ready, whether it be because of equipment failure or whether it was just because you're not in the groove, when it suited him, it had to be done right there and then. But yet when he fucked up, it was okay for him to leave. I'm sorry, fellas, I can't do it today. Mm. <clears throat> I'll tell you, the, the, the lengthiest process of uh, making a record was with Roth. It was? Yeah. Vocals took the lines. Oh, yeah. I think it was, uh, now don't quote me on this, but I think it was Ted who said, you know, I've never worked on an asshole like him before in my <laughs> life. And please don't quote that. No, I won't. Because I don't want to put Ted on the line. Right. But I'm pretty sure it was Ted who said it. Hmm. You know, I, one time, and this you can print, <laughs> uh, we were sitting around in the studio, we were at 5150. Uh, Ted already feels like he's losing a little bit of control because mm -hmm. now he's not the one who can direct and say, okay, time to start and time to stop. Right. But uh, Ted came, <clears throat> and we were working on a song, and Roth comes walking in his usual demeanor like this. My world, my world. <laughs> and we're sitting down, and I forget what it was we were talking about, but he turns to Ted, and he says, uh, Excuse me, Ted, but uh, can you leave uh, the studio? Uh, we have something to discuss. Well, Ted left, okay, and we discussed. Roth left afterwards, and Ted pulled me aside, and he said, Hey, look, Al, I don't mean to be a prick. But nobody treats me like that. Nobody. When I walk into a studio, I expect to get respect <clears throat> because I am running this piece of machinery. I am doing this. Nobody kicks me out. It doesn't matter where the physical location of it is. It doesn't matter if it's 5150, Sunset, Amigo, you name it, you know, the power station, wherever. <laughs> When he walks in, it's his gig. And he got so pissed off at Rod, I couldn't believe it. I was going, oh, God, I didn't even know you had it in you, Ted. <laughs> hmm. What is Edward like? Uh, what was he like during the sessions with, with Dave doing vocals and things? Being at, at this new studio and the whole new atmosphere. I mean, What was Ed like? Yeah. Ed, um, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't... Uh, it's hard to describe the good vibes that Ed has. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. It's just like when Sammy walks in. When Sammy Hager walks in, it doesn't matter whether he says fuck you to you or whatever, you automatically smile. Mm -hmm. The guy is up, doesn't have a, you know, he never bothers you. Just, it's hard to, <laughs> listen. <laughs> The reason I get like this is because after 11 years of having to live with a fucking cocksucker like a Roth, you don't, you, all of a sudden you appreciate what it's like to be with normal human beings. When, when did things start going sour? You, you, you said four years ago. I mean, things started going sour about four years ago, yes, because Ed wanted to leave the band. And I told Ed, look, I think you're making a mistake if you do that, because we've worked so long We've worked hard, we've toured so long, we have three records under our belt. Uh, if you leave now, you're gonna have to start over again. Now, in that respect, I have to admit, I was more thinking business than I was thinking anything else. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to start over from scratch. I mean, there are so many, there are countless great musicians out there, and because they can't get their shit together business-wise, they end up playing clubs and just being nothing, right. okay? Yeah. I wanted to have this band uh, be heard by as many people as possible, and preferably without Roth's voice. <laughs> but, 
You think I'm joking? <laughs> so anyway, I convinced Ed to stay with the whole thing. And I was hoping that uh, this year, 1985, would be the most lucrative financially for us so that we'd have the money, never have to worry about it, and that money would be the vehicle for us to be able to do whatever we fucking wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turns out, we didn't need the five million dollars a piece anyway, okay? <laughs> so, Sammy chucked his solo career, we got rid of Rot, we got rid of the lousy management, we got rid of the lousy office situation, <clears throat> we got rid of the whole fucking ball of wax. Now we're starting fresh. Mm -hmm. And this band is going to be the band. Really? This is the one, I'm telling you. Hmm. Well, you, I'm well, sorry, go. No, no, go, go. ahead. You're talking about management, no Monk. Yeah. You replaced Marshall. Correct. What happened was Marshall was a very, Marshall Burrell was a very um, short-sighted person. Mm -hmm. He thought it was the, the Van Halen was a flash in the pan, mm -hmm. so he tried to collect on as many things as he possibly could. Right. Never did anything in the interest of the band. Didn't right. know what the fuck was going on. Right. The only thing he ever had on his side was that he was related to Milton Burrow. Uh, Milton threw him in the can one time. Had him arrested. Seriously? Yeah, because uh, Marshall burglarized his house. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Monk, who was a very good smusher, uh, I guess it must have been a drunken stupor. We decided, well, Monk, you know, you sit there and you spend a lot of time and you're good, so why don't you be our manager? Where did he come from and how did you meet him? He was our tour manager the first year. He was your tour manager? Yes. In 78? Yes. So he worked with Marshall? Yeah. And he was, again, like I say, we were very, we were green. We didn't know. Monk had been on tour before, he knew the ropes, he knew the people, he knew so-and-so. He was in touch with Premier Talent, mm. Frank Barcelona, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm. He knew a number of uh, promoters, et cetera. We knew nothing. All we knew is, okay, here's my drums, I gotta play. Right. Here's Ed, I, here's my guitar, I gotta play, right. et cetera, right. Right. okay? Wasn't Noel the, uh, the twin manager for uh, Sex Pistols? Yes, he was. That right? And that's why they put him on our case. But uh, Warner Brothers said, look, this band looks like they're really going to be some rowdy, so we better have somebody who can control them. And they figured for three weeks, Monk could handle it. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing led to another. Like I said, it turned out to be an 11-month tour. Uh, and then uh, Burrow was out of the picture, so we figured, why not Monk? You know, we spent so much time with him. When you sleep on the same bus, when you eat from the same place, and you're, you're together that much, right. you tend to have a certain amount of... Uh, uh, friendship or camaraderie, mm -hmm. whatever you call mm -hmm. it, and he sold himself and said, yeah, you know, I'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. I know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So we we got him as our manager. Well, things just kind of got past him. Uh, he was like like Roth, uh, his own publicity. He started believing. Look, here's a manager who's got his own bus, five bodyguards, carrying guns, going out and beating up on little kids because of bootlegging. And he just, he reveled in it, man. This guy, his favorite magazine is Soldier of Fortune. Things just got out of hand. All I can say is, the proof is in the pudding, we got rid of him. When, when was he dismissed? His contract uh, was a monthly contract, I think. It was a yearly. And anyway, one of those short-term deals. <laughs> and he, uh, it was uh, January 1st, 1985. He wanted a new contract. He gave it to us in writing, you know, and the whole bullshit. And what it basically amounted to was that he got the same amount of money, which was, well, let's see, uh, in, during 1984, he made roughly $2.2 million. Yeah. <laughs> for doing what? <laughs> Nothing. For running around like a crazed maniac in a fucking parking lot beating up on a 15-year-old kid. Anyway, we'll strike that from the record. So he wanted a new contract. And what it basically was was the same, the same contract he had before, only with a longer uh, time. Term. Uh, yeah, longer term. And that was it. And it was completely um, out of line. 
because he um, okay Ed again Ed can pick through this stuff mm -hmm. as to what he wants printed and whatnot but uh, I can tell you that he basically lost this uh, about five million bucks really how simple there's one here prime example note for note word for word black on white we had a deal there was a, a a car stereo company wanting to endorse us. Total amount, two and a half million dollars. It's called Sparkomatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, because of Roth and Monk, we lost the whole deal. We lost it. Roth said, nah, that's not a prestigious company. Who the fuck wants to be associated with Sparkomatic and so and so? Well, while they're sitting there going, who wants to be associated with it? Yes, picked up the deal. They got the two and a half million, <laughs> and they're on fucking Easy Street while we're sitting there with nothing. What, what tour was this going to be, the 1984 tour? Yeah. It was all set up. It was ready to go. And so what they basically say... They pissed it away. Let us use Roth your name in conjunction. Roth, Roth blames it on, on Monk. Monk blames it on <laughs> Roth. And both of them blame it on me. <laughs> You know, it's, what is this shit? <laughs> so we lost that. There were there were a number of things that we could have gotten in Japan, where all you have to do is stand there with a pack of cigarettes. Now I hate to be racist or racial, but they love Caucasians. Mm. So you get some blonde hair guy standing there with the rest of the band holding a pack of cigarettes. Mm. I wouldn't mind uh, pocketing a million dollars. It would take two days to do it. You fly over, you do it, you fly back, two days out of your life. Big deal and you got a million dollars in your pocket. No, they didn't want to do it. <laughs> a bunch of stupid assholes. You can tell me if this is true. Um, one of the girls up at the office when I was down there looking through the files and stuff told me that it was Noel's idea for the band to do its own merchandising. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for that. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, that has to be acknowledged. That's right. true. Right. I was just curious if that was true. Yeah, but what you fail to realize is that uh, although we did probably make a little bit more than had we gone with a Brockham or Winterland, is that all the money that we made was pumped right back into the tour. We grossed, uh, I think, about 22 million bucks. That's in t-shirt sales alone. When's this? In 1984. Jesus. But the tour itself, to perpetuate itself, you have to have financing. You got 80 people, you got 10 trucks, 10 semis, you got 10 buses, you know, you got Noel's love dungeon, his own <laughs> bus with his fucking fat pig of a wife. You know, I'll retract that statement. Yeah. She's not a fat pig of a wife, she's a fat pig. <laughs> and it costs money. So all the money that was made was just there to perpetuate the whole fucking circus. Mm. Wow. I mean, 1985 or 1984 was the biggest year that the band ever had. Yes, it was the biggest year. But let's put it this way. It could have been, um, I can honestly say, it could have been for the individuals in the band, uh, probably financially, profitably, three times as much. Because the whole thing just became completely blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, now where, where have you seen uh, a manager walking around with five bodyguards and his own bus? Yeah. His own bus. Yeah, he was a strange guy. Oh yeah, oh you guys nuts. Hmm. Belongs in a fucking asylum. So basically things started going bad four years ago. You talked it out of it, things basically you- Things were always bad and it was my feeling that eventually, especially seeing how the band was uh, getting a response from uh, the audience and from sales, etc., that I convinced Ed to please just stay with it. I know you hate this. I know you can't stand rock. I know you want to play with other musicians. I know you want to do your own thing, etc. Please just stay with it so that at least for one year we can clean up and be financially secure because mm -hmm. after all that is what we have been working for mm -hmm. anybody who says that uh, all they do is for art uh, is lying to their fucking teeth so Ed 
said, okay, I'll stick with it. And right at, uh, well, like I said, January 1st, 1985, everything just completely fell apart. Roth wanted to go make a movie. Uh, uh, Monk wanted his new contract and instead decided to go into the pizza parlor business. <clears throat> and they just kept us on hold. They used every fucking excuse imaginable to stay out of the studio. I had heard that, that Dave basically wanted to go off and do the big tours like you guys had done. Edward wanted to stay, do sh shorter twos, and work more on the records. Bullshit. Bullshit? That's bullshit. First of all, let me tell you, from a physical standpoint, Ross' voice, he was losing it. He couldn't sing anymore. I can show you tapes. Now, you want to come to the pad? I'll show you tapes. The motherfucker can't sing. He was getting creaky. His body's getting old. He's 30 years old. Now, I hate to sound such like a, a cut-and-dried person, but a fighter only has X amount of years in their body. You know, you go through 50 fights, and, well, you're getting old. Well, you go through 11 years of jumping around and prancing around. You're getting old, pal, and he just couldn't do it anymore. I'll show you footage of the Us Festival, where Roth's major show was like this. Wiggling his butt in front of the audience and standing like this. I'm serious. That was the most... Uh, oh, God. The only, the only thing that kept me smiling was that I knew I was making $16,000 a minute. <laughs> you guys made a million and a half bucks, right? That's right. That's the only thing that kept me smiling, because it surely wasn't the fucking music. The only person who makes me happy on stage is Ed and Mike. Yeah. Mm. And now, with Sammy, I tell you, it's like you know, a fresh shot of, uh, of adrenaline or something. The next question, were, were there... Uh, uh, had you talked to other singers, or were there any other singers in mind? Nobody? How, how, did, how did Sammy come up? I mean, how was the it was basically, made? I think, I think uh, Ed and Sammy just talked on the phone, and the next thing I knew, Sammy was sitting down here in the studio. Did it have anything to do with Ed and Sammy having the same uh, uh, mechanic? Claudio? Who knows? I don't, I don't know that. Yeah, Ed would know, obviously. That I don't know. Hmm. But, uh... So, was there a point... You, you, you described actually the last time that you and Ed and Dave had, had talked. It's kind of a Armageddon. No, the last time we talked, uh, the last physical contact, human to human, was between Ed and Dave. And it was, uh, we, were, we were coming at wit's end. It was, I think it was the middle of June, 1985. Mm -hmm. So it was six months into the year, and yet nothing had been recorded. Roth had used every fucking excuse, like I said. First, he said that I was three days late coming back from Canada. He wanted to work January 1st. Now, nobody in a doggone right mind works on January 1st. Come on, man. At least not something that's going to be productive. Give me a break. <laughs> January 1st, after New Year's Eve, you're going to get in there and you're going to do something? Give me a break. So uh, things went on down, down the road. And then he said, well, I can't uh, be creative as long as this Mr. Monk situation is still uh, over our heads. But yet, in the meantime, he did find time to make two videos. Well, I guess he wasn't being creative after all, right? <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, things go on a little bit further down the line, and he said, uh, well, I can't uh, go in the studio without a producer. Okay, so Ed and I got in contact with uh, Ted Templeman, and Ted was willing to work. We also got in contact with Quincy Jones, who was willing to work. Well, Ross still didn't show up. Finally, Ed just really, he was getting ticked off. I mean, you sit around and you go, what the hell is going on? This guy's noodle. So Ed drove over to Roth's house. It's called Rothwood. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> so Ed goes over to Rothwood and, uh, you know, Ed's not one to mince words. He's not diplomatic. He doesn't kiss ass. I mean, when he got something to say, he says it. And which really cracks me up, you know, for my little brother to be <laughs> like that. No, seriously, it really, I'm proud of the guy. So he just went up there and said, what the fuck is your problem? You gonna fucking show up or not? 
And Rossi says, well, you know, I can't work with Alex. He's set in his ways, he's stubborn, and I can't stand working with a drunk. At which point, Ed just turned around and he felt like belting him and he said, hey, Roth, fuck you. In the 11 years, like I said, I've, I've been drunk on stage twice, mm -hmm. but I still played the set. Roth has missed five shows. He's fucked up from left to right. Uh, at the US Festival in front of 450,000 people live, he made an asshole out of himself. And on top of that, part of the contract for the million and a half was to deliver three songs to the people at M or at, uh, from the US Festival. You, you know, son. Uh huh. I had to sit there with Angelus, Pete Angelus, who was our, who was our lighting director. I had to sit there and doctor that shit up you wouldn't believe is if you would have seen the original footage man I cringed oh, it was embarrassing as shit mm. and he has he has a nerve look I'm, I've been known to tip a few but I've never missed a show in Wood. <laughs> so Edward walks out of the house and, and that's uh, the last contact physically that we ever had with him because after that the attorneys took over and there was to be a meeting uh, with the four uh, of the previous Van Halen uh, and Roth would not show up because he was afraid that I was going to physically harm him. Now I would love to, <laughs> but uh, far be it for me yeah. to sit there and have my pocket robbed of a lot of dollars because right. he's going to sue my ass. You know? right. I, but you, you mentioned he, that he actually wanted to, there was some kind of a suit that he wanted to bring against you guys for... Two of them. Two suits? Yeah. One was that uh, he claims that he is partially responsible for the fame, or at least the stature of the name Van Halen. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very arguable in court because we are as much as part of uh, making David Lee Roth mm -hmm. a name. Mm -hmm. The other one was that uh, he claims that he wrote, he wants 50% of the publishing because he claimed that he wrote well, he, his input was more than the rest of the band. More than 25 percent? Yeah. Which again is arguable, you know, I mean... Yeah, he wrote the lyrics. But yeah, Ted Templeman uh, wrote more of his melodies than he ever did in his life. <laughs> as did Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald? Yeah. Let's go inside, let me have a drink and a yeah. cigarette and I'll explain this one to you. Good. Okay, so where were we? Michael McDonald, Ted lawsuits. Right. Okay, so uh, the situation with Roth was that uh, he had a couple of lawsuits that he was thinking of, of instigating. Oh, he never brought him up? No, he never brought him up because he knows damn well he's not going to win anything. But, uh, like I said, if anyone, Ted probably helped Roth with melodic structure and singing and phrasing more than anybody around. So right there, that cans his, uh, his appeal for, the, for mm -hmm. X amount of money mm -hmm. for saying that he wrote all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really was kind of funny was that uh, when we wrote the song, uh, Drop Dead Legs, oh, I'm sorry, it was I'll Wait. Uh, Roth was completely uh, at wit's end. He didn't know what to do for it. So Ted Templeman told Roth, why don't you go see Michael McDonald, just kind of hang around with him, and maybe he can scat sing something to him. Hmm. So Roth went with uh, Don, and I think Ed was there. But anyway, they got together with Michael McDonald, and they had a little tape recorder, and they, they played the song. And uh, Michael McDonald was scat singing to it. Well, when the song came out, and it turned out to be uh, one of the good singles, <clears throat> lo and behold, we get a letter from uh, from uh, Michael McDonald's attorneys. Uh, oh, we want X amount of money. We had to buy him out for twenty thousand dollars because he says he's the one who wrote "I'll Wait." You really had to do that. We could have beat the thing in court, but it would have cost more in attorney fees than. Just if we just bought him right out. Crazy shit, man. 
Dave didn't didn't want to do jump initially, did he? I don't I don't know what the hell went on in that guy's mind. Uh, I think if if uh, if his musical taste, uh, I know they're different from ours. When I say ours, I'm talking about Ed, Mike, and me, and now Sammy. Uh, it's definitely shown in what he did for his EP, which was a bunch of cover tunes of, uh, of garbage. I'm just a fucking big ego, and now everybody follows where I go. Oh, I'm sorry, it's just a jiggle. <laughs> you know what I mean? If that's any indication of what uh, what he wants to do, that's... Uh, did did Ed, Ed have any feelings about uh, Dave going off and doing the record? No, because uh, Roth did ask us, do you mind if I do a record? And we said, no, not at all. We didn't know that what he was really doing was setting the whole thing up for his video thing and then seeing how well he fared on his own before he cut the umbilical cord, so to speak. Do you believe that's what he was doing? Oh, yeah, definitely. Why do you think he, waits, he waited six months before he actually said, I don't want to make a record with you guys? Had he been on the level and said on January 1st, I don't want to make a record, I want to be a movie star, fine, that would have saved us six months. Mm -hmm. But instead, the cocksucker sat there and made excuses upon excuses upon excuses. Okay. I can't say that the, uh, the previous 11 years that we worked with him weren't interesting. It was definitely a thrill to get out on stage for the first time and, and have an audience uh, be very receptive and rowdy and loud and the rest of the crap and uh, I also can't say that it, uh, it wasn't fun coming up with songs like Running With The Devil or Ain't Talking About Love and some of that thing but as the years went by he started deviating more and more from what it was that we wanted to do now I like the fact that there were four different personalities. I mean, Ed likes uh, stuff that's more jazzy-based, you know, uh, progressive rock. Mm -hmm. Mike likes Disneyland. Uh, <laughs> I, I prefer I prefer the head-banging stuff. I mean, you know, some of my favorite bands are Duff Leopard and uh, just the Ozzy Osbourne and things like that. Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, and Roth was completely on the wacko side. He liked Fred Astaire. So, in a way that was good, because that way, it's like four people throwing uh, different influences into mm -hmm. one pot, mm -hmm. and what comes out mm -hmm. is reasonably good. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, uh, so what happens now? What happens now is that uh, Van Halen, which is now Sammy Hager, Edward Van Halen, Michael Anthony, and your most humble servant, myself. Uh, <laughs> we are going to make a record. We're already halfway done with it, really. Are you really? Yeah. The music is there. We just haven't recorded it, and we haven't done it on a, a, a multi-track. We just done it, just working out the mm -hmm. songs. Mm -hmm. So the, are these all new tunes? I mean, these are, yeah. these, these are new tunes that Ed may have had. You know, waiting around for next uh, I would say some of the stuff was, uh, he has played for Roth. You know, as a matter of fact, I wish I could, I, next time I talk to you, I'll bring some tapes of what Roth sang to the stuff and what Sammy sang to it. I think Ed had told me about some of that stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, the difference is amazing. Huh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you feel that, I mean, in, in your mind, if you never spoke to Dave again, it would, uh, it just ends like it that? It would be too soon. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I, I don't mind uh, voicing my opinion as to what I think of the guy. Uh, I think he's an asshole. He's a cunt. He's an under, underhanded, low-level piece of shit. If I ever see him, and this is a fucking threat, motherfucker. If I ever see him, I'm going to kick the shit out of him. Do you have any feelings about what his career might be like? I don't give a flying fuck. I hope he bombs. No, I'm serious. You know, I, I... I think the main reason I'm upset, if I am upset, does it sound like I'm upset? <laughs> no, I think the, the, main, the main reason is that um, 
he went about it in such an underhanded way. Had he just said on January 1st when he wanted to start working, uh, I don't want to make a record, I want to make a movie. Then we would have said, fine, go ahead, and we'll make uh, arrangements accordingly. And we would say, well, do you want to come back, uh, let's say, October and make a record? And we would take it from there. But it was just the whole thing of him being so deceptive or deceiving and not until the final end when Ed finally confronted him saying that no, no I don't want to make a record I want to make a movie had he said that right off the bat we would have uh, gained six months mm -hmm. but again I I really feel that it's uh, the whole thing is going to work out for the best mm -hmm. do you have any idea when when the record might be ready well, since we got the uh, other legalities out of the way, which was uh, Sammy uh, negotiating with Geffen, because he was uh, under contract with Geffen, mm -hmm. now that we have that out of the way, we can actually go full blast. The first step, obviously, is to let people know that we are a band. Mm -hmm. Van Halen is now Sammy, Ed, Mike, and me. And the first thing that we'll we'll be able to show them we'll be at this us i mean i'm sorry at the uh, mtv thing this thursday or friday rather friday sammy will be there mm -hmm. with, with, with you three mm -hmm. no it's not sammy with us three it's us four okay. Okay. are you guys up for awards no i don't want to show up for the awards just showing up. no we're just going to be there for the uh, press conference before and the party after <laughs> So that will actually be the first official announcement? Yeah. Will Dave be there? Oh yeah, well he's up for about six awards I think. And one of them is uh, the best female. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are going to go out on the road then? When, uh, when, it's, when it's ready? I think basically what will happen is we um, will go as fast as we can, or not as fast, but see how things come with the record. And then um, do major tours no more of this uh, 10 month a year stuff uh -huh. um, you know I like Missoula Montana but uh, you know I do have a cat to feed <laughs> I kind of be home once in a while uh -huh. yeah so no we'll play we'll play uh, hopefully the major markets and you have to remember Sammy on his own has a following uh -huh. so and I've seen some of the stuff that he does this guy is, Sammy's amazing. He can sit there with a microphone about this high, you know, uh, mouth height, and he can just jump over it without a springboard. <laughs> so, so when do you think you might go out if you did? Um, okay, let's see, we're in what, uh, September. September, summer, beginning of summer. Summer? Yeah. He's still almost a year away from going out. Oh, it's not a year away. August. September, you figure you take September, October, no wonder. <laughs> I would say it would, we would have the record done by the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And depending on how happy we are with it, uh, we'll put a tour together accordingly. Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. Yeah. You're telling him. Edward's happy? Yeah. Oh, shit. I've never seen a smile on his face like that before. <laughs> when we play with, uh, with Sammy. It's great. No. Okay, ask me something interesting. You don't drink, you go. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Edward when he met Valerie? What kinds of... What, what kinds of uh, okay, again, this is going to be something you're going to have to... Uh, sure, I know, but I mean, it must have been something special that, that you sensed. Well, the funny thing is, I was the first one to meet Valerie. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Look at Patrick. That's not Patrick can verify this. He tells it. He tells were me you, a lot. Were you in the room? I was in the room. Oh yeah, it was you, Scrotum, and 
Squirrel! Yeah. I can't believe you fucking remember that. Of course I remember that. Wow. Yeah, fucking scrotum. <laughs> Who's scrotum? That was Valerie's boyfriend that evening. <laughs> no, it was funny because we were sitting there and we were, uh, I guess it was Shreveport. Was it Shreveport? Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the lapse of luxury had started to come, so what we happened to have was uh, machines, you know, play backstage, and always get that kind of crap, a lot of food. And I got kind of bored. And uh, Steve Vando. This was, is the this is the Van Halen gig. Yeah. And Steve Vando, who was our tour manager at that time, uh, said, "Hey, you gotta see this chick, man, with a little teardrop butt." And I said, "What? What are you talking about?" He says, "Yeah, man, that was Bert. Now he's over in his room over here." So I threw on the old robe and I walked in and I see the guys all sitting there, and uh, you know, like I said, there was Scrotum, and there was uh, <laughs> there was Patrick, and there was Valerie, and I forget some of the other people who were there. Uh, anyway, I just came in, popped in, said, hello, how you doing? And, uh, well, then we played the show, and afterwards, uh, we were sitting backstage, and I guess, uh, Valerie just really took a, a liking to Ed, and uh -huh. vice versa. Didn't you tell Valerie about this band, Van Halen, you should come listen to see the band or something? Didn't she fly out to one of the gigs or something? Yeah, she was on, uh, she was on Actor Strike. Here. It just so happened she was striking that week, and I said, "Look, you gotta check out Van Halen. They're here. You know, they're gonna be here after you know, like a Tuesday night or something. Uh -huh. Just come on out for at least a couple of days." And uh -huh. she came out, and uh, that's when they met. I just when he when he came in to uh, introduce himself, he's probably. He, I've never seen him. It happened to me the first time I've ever met him. First and the only time I've ever seen him so nice. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was said, how do you do? I'm Alex Van Halen. Nice <laughs> to meet you. He said, hey man, what's up? <laughs> when was this? In Shreveport? Oh. Funny. Well, anyway, from, from, the very, from the very first time that they met, I could see a you know, certain magic. It was like we're in love from... <laughs> Whatever. What's up? Oh, well, I'm just giving you the down and dirty. Oh. This is for the book. Oh. I want to go to McDonald's. Okay. Can you bring back a cheese? A, um, what do you want? Play a fish. Okay. Do you got a Winston? No. Nope. Hold on, I'll be one second. Yeah. So he seemed happy. Um, it's hard to describe. It was a certain magic, you know, they, they just, uh, they hit it off from the very beginning. How long after they met did they met? Mm, I think they were together about six months. Mm. Alex, I'm running out of questions. What about the videos? Can you run down all the videos that Van Halen made? Do you know? Well, we've made a number of them. And, um, until... Uh, until Hot for Teacher, I was involved in it heavily, and I think the whole the whole problem <clears throat> of what, what went wrong with Van Halen, what went wrong with the band, what went wrong with everybody who was involved, was basically Roth wanted to run everything. If he didn't do it, it didn't exist. He wanted to direct videos. He wanted to star in them. He wanted to be the main guy on stage. He even went so far as to um, tell my wife to get off stage because she, he, he said that uh, he didn't want any other blonde on stage. I worked with uh, a number of the videos prior to uh, Hot for Teacher, doctoring him up, making Roth look good because he was such a fucking jerk. You'd be, you'd be amazed. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you have five minutes, I can take you up to, to the pad and you can take a look at some of the stuff he did when he was in Mexico. Holy shit. It is so bad. 
Did you ever, you ever, have you seen him? Uh, when he was, I'm just a gigolo. Oh, the video? Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, the one he did in Mexico. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, the guy was a maniac. And, uh, you know, if it seems that I'm obsessed with uh, talking about him, uh, it's probably because I spent 11 years of my life working with uh, three people who I like, or two people who I like, and one who I didn't. Ed and Mike were always uh, the best people to work with. I mean, Ed was, fuck, he was always smiling, always having a good time. And when you play music, uh, there's a certain vibe that you generate. You know, one person gets one vibe and, and it, it goes back and forth and it makes you smile and it's fun. With Roth, it was more like, oh shit, do I have to do this again? <laughs> Uh, I know I'm sounding like ragging, but uh, and I'm sorry to, to take up so much of your tape because you're yeah. going to have to cut some of this out. But uh, that's the way it really was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy now that things have come together. And like he said, like Roth said in his uh, thing on calendar, I will say the same thing. Uh, I wish him the best of luck because he won't need it. <laughs> Let me, let me turn it around for just one minute. What what were the good moments? With Roth? Yeah. Was it exciting hearing you really got me in the radio for the first time? To be quite honest with you, there were never any good moments with Roth. No, that's that's a, that's the honest to God truth. The the uh, the good moments I shared with Ed and Mike when we got together. I mean, it was like, hey, we're bruds, you know, we're bloods. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, we, we were, we were, uh, we had fun. When Roth was around, you had to sit there and act like him and behave like him. And he thought he fucking knew everything. And he thought he was the most, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, worldly person. Mm -hmm. And he always had his fucking phony air of bullshit. Man, if you go to dinner, you sit there and you have dinner with somebody. Okay, sorry if my knife is on the wrong side and my fork is on the wrong side. Big deal. Let's eat. Let's drink. Let's have a good time. That's what you're there for. Not sitting there trying to outshow somebody how you know what, uh, what social graces are. Hey, Tone Chasers. How are you? So we've come to the end of our journey, our six-segment journey on uh, my very rare and uh, very cool interview with Alex Van Halen from back in 1985. Um, a couple things. I, one, I hope you dug them, of course. Secondly, uh, in this last section here, um, you, you hear some clarinet playing at about the 37 minute, 15 second mark. Now, I'm not going to swear who that is, but... Um, you know, you guys can make an educated guess as good as mine. I believe it's him, but, uh, you know, it was a long time ago. Secondly, uh, you hear someone named Patrick referred to. That's Patrick Bertinelli, Valerie Bertinelli's brother. And lastly, there's a point in the conversation where you hear a voice saying, hey, I'm going to McDonald's. And Alex saying, hey, get me a cheese. And then he changes his mind and wants a filet of fish. I am not positive, I think that's Edward. Uh, what I found interesting was um, this person comes into the room and Alex says, yeah, I'm, I'm taking a deep dive into the book. And this voice, this disembodied voice goes, oh. And it's said in such a way that it reminded me about how Edward would have reacted as if, oh, right, there's a book being written about me and I kind of forgot about it, but it's still cool, man, and, and do a good job and give Steve what he needs. Anyway, that's my interpretation. So at the end of the day, look, guys, I, I hope you dug the interview. Um, it was pretty rare. And uh, yeah, listen, 
I know a lot of you have written and left comments and, and, and you have dug the interview. If you'd like to show your appreciation, I would really love a review up on Amazon. Just go to Amazon. You can type in Ch Tone Chaser. You'll find my page. Uh, if you didn't buy the book on Amazon, it's cool. You can still leave a review. So that's about it, guys. I will uh, talk to you later. Um, volume 3 is here. T3 uh, arrived yesterday, and I'm madly sending out books as we uh, speak. So I uh, hope you guys have your copies. And if not, uh, you can go check it out on my uh, webpage, ToneChaserBook.com. See you, everybody. Thank you. V for Van Halen.